Good morning. We've been living under abnormal circumstances and we are facing problems, small and big. Some of us are facing minor, and even negligible problems. But some are facing major issues like a brother who is at risk of losing a job during this quarantine, and even a life-threatening one that our brother Kenny is facing right now in the hospital's ICU. In and of ourselves, we are powerless. We cannot change this bad situation. We cannot just erase all difficulty problems that arose. So we are tempted to feel anxious. We are robbed of joy in God. But this should not be the case for us who are in Christ Jesus. Remember, who is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? In the Word of God, in the book of Colossians, God says, Jesus is the exact likeness and manifestation of God. He is the creator, the architect, the builder, and the goal of the universe. He is eternal, and in Him all things hold together. Christ will come to have first place in everything. Through Christ, the entire creation will be reconciled to God. And we believers in Christ, we have redemption, the forgiveness of all our sins. In Christ, we have all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In Christ, we are complete. In Christ, we have the hope of eternal glory. And far, far more could be said of Him. The point is, when we are facing problems in our lives, let's not be anxious. Let us not fill our minds with things that are far inferior in comparison to the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. As God's word in Colossians chapter 3 commands us, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. We should set our minds on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. Problems, difficulties, and trials should cause us to seek Christ as our all-sufficient Savior, even more than we do. When we are depressed, we should seek Him as our joy. When we are anxious, we seek Him as our peace. When we are empty and emotionally drained, we seek Him as our fullness. When we lack wisdom, we seek Him and His Word for the insight we need. Whatever you need, go to Christ. The Puritan Thomas Watson wrote, If a man has sunshine, he does not complain that he lacks the light of a candle. Has he not enough who has the unsearchable riches of Christ? Amen. The all-sufficient Christ is ours. So as we go through all challenges of this extraordinary season, let us daily see Christ. Lean on Him. Trust in Him and know more of Him than we ever have before. He is everything that we need and more. So make sure, above all else, to commune with Him constantly, seek His face and worship Him. For Jesus Christ is our all in all. was lost in darkest night, yet thought I knew the way, the sin that promised joy and life had led me to the grave. I had no hope that you But as I run 
joy he'll always be. I trust him now, I trust him when life's fleeting days shall end. Where is the sunshine? We praise you that you are supreme and above all. You are the image of the invisible God and the firstborn over all creation. Jesus, you are the sustainer of all things and you are seated in the place of absolute authority. Thank you, O God, for your rich mercy that in Christ we are made alive, raised up, and enthroned in the heavenly kingdom with him. Jesus, you are the supreme ruler over all creation, the supreme king over all kingdoms, and you love us, your church, as your own bride, with a love so pure and strong beyond our comprehension. Reveal this to our hearts in the deeper way, O Lord, each day, for we long to know you more and more. We desire to make you first and foremost in everything. For you, O Christ, are indeed our all in all. In your name we pray. Amen. Greetings and grace to you. I trust that you and the members of your families are all well or in the pink of health. 
safe from the coronavirus. This is the seventh straight Sunday that we have had to worship the Lord in this manner. And I pray that everyone will have no trouble accessing our services on the internet. Hopefully, friends, kaunting tulog na lang at magkikita-kita at magsasamba na tayo sa ESNA. But for now, let's make the most of this and open our time of study with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are truly grateful because your word is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. And we are grateful because through your Holy Spirit, you open your word to us so as to encourage us, edify us, make straight our path. We trust your God that your Holy Spirit will have freedom wherever we are to minister to us your word. Plant it deep in our hearts, O Lord, so that we might not just be merely hearers of the word, but doers as well. We give you glory in Jesus' name. I picked up this interesting anecdote from our daily bread. It read, American pastor and author James H. Brooks told of visiting a friend's house and hearing the music of a bird singing. It was not the ordinary sound of chirping. Instead, it resembled the strains of a lovely melody. At first, Brooks did not know where it was coming from. But when he glanced around the room, he saw a beautiful bullfinch in a birdcage. The lady of the house explained that it had been taught to sing that way at night. She related that the teacher would repeat the notes time and again until the bird was able to mimic them. But she added that this was possible only because it was dark and the bird's attention was not diverted. Now isn't it true that often we learn our sweetest songs when the blackness of trial and suffering close around us or when our attention is not diverted. When we are enveloped in the darkness of a trial or suffering, that is when we learn the deepest and sweetest lessons from God. This is something we can see in David's experience. He wrote his most significant psalm when he found himself in the darkness of pain and suffering. For our study today, I have chosen one such psalm. I invite you now to turn to Psalm 38, verses 1 to 22. I'll be reading from the NASB. O Lord, rebuke me not in your wrath, and chasten me not in your burning. For your arrows have sunk deep into me, and your hand has pressed down on me. There is no soundness in my flesh because of your indignation. There is no health in my bones because of my sin. For my iniquities are gone over my head. As a heavy burden, they weigh too much for me. My wounds grow foul and they fester because of my folly. I am bent over and greatly bowed down. I go mourning all day long. For my loins are filled with burning and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am benumbed and badly crushed. I groan because of the agitation of my heart. Lord, all my desire is before you, and my sighing is not hidden from you. My heart throbs, my strength fails me, and the light of my eyes, even that, has gone from me. My loved ones and my friends stand aloof from my plague, and my kinsmen stand afar off. Those who seek my life play snares for me, and those who seek to injure me have threatened destruction, and they devise treachery all day long. But I, like a deaf man, do not hear, and I am like a mute man who does not open his mouth. Yes, I am like a man who does not hear, and in whose mouth are no arguments. For I hope in you, O Lord, you will answer, O my God. For I said, May they not rejoice over me, who, when my foot slips, 
would magnify themselves against me. For I am ready to fall, and my sorrow is continually before me. For I confess my iniquity. I am full of anxiety because of my sin. But my enemies are vigorous and strong, and many are those who hate me wrongfully. And those who repay evil for good, they oppose me because I follow what is good. Do not forsake me, O Lord. O my God, do not be far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. I am certain that Psalm 38 is not a favorite of many Christians. The reason for this is because it is a penitential psalm. It is a psalm where the writer admits or confesses his sins. And often, we don't like reading about a person's struggle with sin. But this is not the only one of its kind in Scripture. The other penitential psalms include Psalm chapter 6, chapter 32, 51, 102, 130, and 143. In this psalm, Psalm 38, we note David who is identified as the author in the title, admitting in verses 3 to 5 and 18 that he had committed some sins before God. As we can see, however, David does not actually name his sin in this psalm. Rather, he asks for mercy and help from God because of the terrible sickness, loneliness, and isolation he is experiencing as a result of his iniquities. So aside from confessing his sin here, this psalm is also a prayer. It is a prayer evoked by the experience of sickness and the, consent, the consequent sense of alienation from both God and fellow human beings. But even if we don't rank this psalm as one of our favorites, I would like to point out that Psalm 38 hits the hearer's ears with words of realism. It brings words that ring harder in the ear than expected. Words that tell just how much sin hurts. People unfamiliar with scripture generally expect the Bible to be filled with sayings or maxims spooned over with positive thinking. They do not often expect scripture to be filled with frank talk about deep personal distresses over sicknesses and sin and its impact on a person's relationship with the Lord. Sure, these people will admit to being aware that there are some stuff in the Bible about, let's say, Jesus' suffering. People unfamiliar with the Bible will not deny this. They even remember watching the graphic depiction of the Lord's crucifixion in that Mel Gibson movie. And they also remember that there is this story about this fellow, Joel, the guy who needed patience in the face of horrendous trouble and pain. But they conclude, that's all there is to suffering in the Bible, right? Well, Psalm 38 is no baby blister. It's no paper cut that we can wrap in band aid. The psalm is deadly serious. The situation, if I may picture it, is this way. It's like when a person is very sick and needs to go to the hospital and he says, it's okay. I don't need to go. But someone close to the seriously ailing person needs to say, no, you're in bad shape. This is serious. I'm calling an ambulance. Left on his own, the person would die. Well, you might say that Psalm 38 is a prayer from the back of the ambulance on the way to the hospital. King David is the man in the back of the ambulance. David is suffering serious physical and spiritual anguish over his sins as he prays to the Lord. It's as though the sirens and the ambulance are blaring and the lights are flashing and the wheels are speeding down the road and King David is praying. David knows the seriousness 
of his sin. He knows it brings death. Now, some people doubt that Psalm 38 was written by King David. To them, the description of the very poor state of health of the writer cannot be connected to David because we do not have anything like this recorded in the narratives about him in the Old Testament. But I think that is a weak argument. To be sure, the Bible does not owe us an account of every time David fell ill. There is no reason for this. And even if David was the king, we cannot assume that because he was living safely in his palace, he was shielded from illnesses. We must understand that serious illnesses were certainly more frequent in ancient societies than today when we have effective drugs and modern medicine. That would therefore make illnesses so commonplace that there would be no reason to mention it in the scriptures unless it had a bearing on an important historical event. So David could have been sick many times in his life, and those times were not recorded in the narratives about him. But what makes this illness unusual is the fact that David sees his illness as a punishment by God for his sin. Now we all know that believers in Christ Jesus do not receive signs from God that explain certain trials come upon us. I mean, if we injure our knees, for example, we do not receive an SMS message from God saying, Child, you have been far too busy that you have not been walking close to me for some time now. This injury on your knee should slow you down to make you look up to me more. We don't get clear messages like that to explain our suffering. What we do know is that our trial or suffering is related to something the Lord wants to do in our lives or that it may be related to an area of stubbornness or rebellion that we have committed. And whichever of the two it may be, we are aware that the Lord intends to help every believer in progressive sanctification. Thus, Hebrews 12 verses 9 to 11 encourages us, We had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Now let's dissect this penitential psalm. It has three main aspects. First, the depth of David's trouble. Second, his transparency before God. And third, the glimmer of hope in the Lord. As David reveals the depth of his trouble, we note a few things. First, David is pierced by God's displeasure. He said in verses 1 to 2, O Lord, rebuke me not in your wrath and chasten me not in your burning anger. For your arrows have sunk deep into me and your hand has pressed down on me. Under a sense of God's displeasure, David cried out to him. By doing this, David actually followed a wise path, that is, drawing near to the Lord in prayer, though he sensed God's wrath and displeasure. And we are given an idea about the severity of his situation. David here used poetic language. In verse 2, he said, Your arrows have sunk deep into me, and your hand presses me down. This, no doubt, refers to acute pains which he endured. Now, interestingly, his prayer here is almost identical to the first verse of Psalm chapter 6, which is the first of the penitential psalm. Notice Psalm chapter 6 verse 1, O Lord, 
Do not rebuke me in your anger, nor chasten me in your wrath. Comparing Psalm 38 and Psalm 6, we realize that they actually bear very close resemblances. Of course, Psalm 6 is shorter, with only 10 verses, as opposed to 22 in Psalm 38. Psalm 38 describes the illness at great length, as well as elaborating upon the desertion by the psalmist's friends and the scheming of his enemies. But each of these elements is present in Psalm chapter 6 too. It is therefore probable that these two psalms were written by David at about the same time and in connection with the same situation or condition. Now, we will note that in each of these two psalms, David's specific prayer is that God will not rebuke him in wrath. Does this mean that David does not want to be rebuked or that he is rejecting discipline? I do not believe so. The emphasis is not upon the discipline but upon the words anger or wrath. What David is asking is that God not discipline him in anger. And the fact that he is asking this shows this is precisely what God is doing. Now, people don't like to hear this about God, that God has wrath, anger, or indignation, and much less that God disciplines in anger. But Romans chapter 1, verse 8 tells us, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Psalm chapter 7, verse 11, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version, adds, God is a just judge. God is angry with the wicked every day. And if you pick up a concordance, it will show that there are more references in Scripture to anger, fury, indignation, and wrath of God than there, is, than there are to his love and tenderness. Arthur Pink wrote, and I quote, It is sad to find many professing Christians who appear to regard the wrath of God as something for which they need to make an apology, or at least they wish there, was, there were no such thing. While some would not go so far as to openly admit that they consider it a blemish on the divine character, yet they are far from regarding it with delight. They like not to think about it, and they ra rarely hear it mentioned without a secret resentment rising up in their hearts against it. Others harbor the delusion that God's wrath is not consistent with his goodness and seek to banish it from their thoughts, end of quote. But what, we, what do we find in Scripture? Well, read the Bible, and you will realize that God has made no attempt to conceal the fact of his wrath. He is not ashamed to make it known that vengeance and fury belong to him. Notice God's own challenge expressed in Deuteronomy 32, verses 39 to 41. See now that I, I am he, and there is no God besides me. It is I who put to death and gives life. I have wounded, and it is I who heal, and there is no one who can deliver from my hand. Indeed, I lift up my hand to heaven, and say, as I live forever, if I sharpen my flashing sword and my hand takes hold on justice, I will render vengeance on my adversaries. And as revealed in our text, God's discipline or chastisement upon David was because his sin had incurred the anger or wrath of God. Now, Psalm 6 as the, gives us the right direction at this point. Because immediately after his appeal to God not to rebuke him in anger 
or discipline him in, uh, with wrath, David cries in verse 2 of Psalm chapter 6, Be gracious, or in some translations, merciful. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am pining away. And in verse 9, verse of chapter 6, he adds, The Lord has heard my supplication. The Lord receives my prayer. David is not suggesting that he does not deserve his sickness that has come upon him. He is not faulting God at all. He is not suggesting that God has treated him unjustly. He admits that he deserves God's anger, but he is appealing God to show mercy. This is always a proper way to appeal to God. It always is right to appeal for mercy, but we certainly cannot demand it. And thankfully, God is a merciful God, and no one who has ever cried to God for mercy was gone away empty-handed. Second, in our text, we learn that the depth of David's trouble shows us that he was overwhelmed by iniquity. In verses 3 to 5 of Psalm 38, he says, There is no soundness in my flesh because of your indignation. There is no health in my bones because of my sin. For my iniquities are gone over my head. As a heavy burden, they weigh too much for me. My wounds grow foul and fester because of my folly. So David not only sends God's displeasure spiritually, but also physically. The chastening hand of God may have been some kind of illness or injury, or it may have been because of the physical toll of stress in a season of deep spiritual depression. And David recognized the hand of God in his misery, but he did not think it was without cause. He knew it was because of his sins or iniquities, which apparently have gone over his head. This implies that he probably recalls the many sins he committed against the Lord. And it was God who made this clear to him. The effects of sin in our lives come either as a result of our own actions or as a result of someone else's. Clearly, David in this psalm is meditating on his own action or sins which brought him to this dilemma. But we need to make clear that not all sickness is due to divine punishment. In fact, most sickness is not. Generally speaking, sicknesses and, and death come because of Adam and Eve's original sin that caused all creation fall into disorder. This explains why men, women, and children all suffer from the ravages of sin, death, and the devil in the world. From our perspective, people sometimes seemingly indiscriminately suffer. While at the same time, we know that there are other people who suffer directly from their sin, like the man who selfishly smokes himself into lung cancer. So not all sickness is a direct punishment from God because of our sins. We need to understand that. It is important to underscore this because physical suffering often depresses us mentally, and in such depressions, we are inclined to see connections between our past sins and our present sickness that do not necessarily exist. These connections may not be there. Remember, Job was a righteous man, and yet he suffered. Job's suffering was actually a demonstration before Satan that a human being will love God for who God is, and not just for what the person can get from him. But the same cannot be said of David here in our psalm. 
God revealed to David his suffering was truly because of sin. And we need to recognize that as long as we are sinners confined in this mortal body, being punished for sin is a possibility for every one of us. As David relates, he was being punished because he had incurred God's wrath or anger. And we should not ignore that God does get angry and could even discipline us in wrath because of sin. Bear in mind that God is angry against sin because it is an offense to His holiness and a rebelling against His authority, a wrong done to His inviolable sovereignty. It will therefore do us well to frequently meditate on this divine perfection, God's wrath. Let me show you a few reasons why this is important and how it could help us. First, so that our hearts might be continually reminded of God's detestation or hatred of sin. We desperately need to be reminded of this because the truth is we are prone to regard sin lightly, to gloss over its hideousness, to make excuses for it. But the more we study and meditate on God's abhorrence of sin and His frightful vengeance upon it, the more likely we are to recognize its heinousness and the more likely we are to keep ourselves from falling into sin. Second, we need to meditate on God's wrath because the exercise produces a true fear in our souls for God. We cannot serve God acceptably unless there is due reverence for His majesty and godly fear of His righteous anger. Thus, we are reminded in Hebrews 12 verses 28 to 29, Let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. Third, we need to meditate on God's wrath because the exercise would draw our souls to praise Him fervently for delivering us from the wrath to come, as 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10 puts it. So knowing that God has saved us and thereby spared us from His wrath is enough reason to praise and worship Him. Meditating upon the wrath of God may prove helpful because, as the psalmist said in verse 3 of Psalm 130, If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? Psalm 1 verse 5 adds, The wicked will not stand in judgment. So let us not behave foolishly like David. Let us not allow wickedness or sin in our lives to provoke God to anger. Third, because of the depth of David's trouble, he admits that he was dismayed or was in turmoil. Verses 6 to 8 of Psalm 38, I am bent over and greatly bowed down. I go mourning all day long. For my lo loins are filled with burning, and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am benumbed and badly crushed. I groan because of the agitation of my heart. The pain of David's sin affected him in almost every way. Aside from his physical afflictions, he described a severe depression and despondency. He struggled mentally and emotionally. David was known as the sweet psalmist of Israel. Yet with great honesty, he groaned before God and man and even composed a bitter psalm describing his misery in the strongest terms. Fourth, in describing the depth of his trouble, David re reveals that he was forsaken by friends and haunted by enemies. Verses 11 to 14. 
My loved ones and my friends stand aloof from my plague, and my kinsmen stand afar off. Those who seek my life snares for me, and those who seek to injure me have threatened destruction, and they devise treachery all day long. But I, like a deaf man, do not hear, and I am like a mute man who does not open his mouth. Yes, I am a, like a man who does not hear and in whose mouth are no arguments. David's misery was unrelieved by either his friends or relatives. This means that his loved ones either did not care or could not help him. He says that his friends stand aloof from his plague in verse 11. The word plague is perhaps chosen for its association with leprosy. For this is how his friends were treating him, as if he had leprosy. David was so depressed and afflicted that he felt powerless to respond to these attacks by his enemies. He adds in verses 17 to 20, For I am ready to fall, and my sorrow is continually before me. For I confess my iniquity. I am full of anxiety because of my sin. But my enemies are vigorous and strong, and many are those who hate me wrongfully. And those who repay evil for good, they oppose me because I follow what is good. He perceived the, en the energy and strength of his enemies, but they were against him for no good reason. The Hebrew word for enemies or adversaries in some translation is the root for the title of Satan. Hence, David is saying that his enemies sat satanically hated him. True, David had sinned against God, but he knows that he had not committed any sin against his enemies. So this was the depth of David's misery. As we have seen, he was aware that his sins brought upon him a world of trouble. But let us not think that if by the grace of God we do not fall into sin, we will be spared from trouble and trials. Again, Job and Paul's situation come to mind. Consider too what became of the Lord's disciples. Christian tradition tells us Peter was crucified head down during the persecution of Nero. But before he was crucified, he was forced to watch the crucifixion of his wife. It is said that during his wife's crucifixion, he stood at the foot of her cross, continuously encouraging her with the words, Remember the Lord, remember the Lord. Andrew had the privilege of preaching in Achaia in which the governor's wife received Jesus Christ as her savior. The governor himself was so upset, he demanded that his wife rejected Christ. When she refused, he crucified Andrew on an X-shaped cross. Andrew hung alive on that cross for two days, and in the midst of his agony, he continued to preach the gospel of Christ still trying to bring people to the Savior. James, the elder son of Zebedee, was beheaded at Jerusalem. It is said that the officer who guarded James on his way to being beheaded by the Roman sword was so impressed with James' courage and constant zeal that he fell down at the apostles' feet and begged pardon for the part he had played in the rough treatment of James. James lifted the man up, embraced and kissed him, and said, Peace, my son, peace be to thee, and the pardon of thy faults. Immediately transformed, the officer publicly confessed his surrender to Christ and was beheaded alongside James. John was banished on the island of Patmos and died of extreme old age. Those who knew him best said that their remembrance of John was a phrase that he constantly used. My little children, 
love one another. Philip was stripped naked, hung upside down by his feet, and pierced in his ankles and thighs so that he would slowly bleed to death. He only had one request, that his dead body would not be wrapped in linen like the body of the Lord because he felt he was not worthy of that. Bartholomew, or Nathaniel, was flayed or skinned alive in Albanopolis, Armenia. Thomas the Doubter was run through the body with a spear in Coromodel in the East Indies. James, the son of Alphaeus, or James the Less, was thrown from the pinnacle of the temple and then beaten to death with a club. Lebeus, who is surnamed Thaddeus, or also called Judas, not Iscariot, was said to be tremendously gifted with the power of God to heal the sick. According to tradition, a certain king in Syria by the name of Adgar was very ill. When he heard Thaddeus' power to heal, he called for him. On his way to the king, says the legend, he healed hundreds of people throughout Assyria. When he finally reached King Agar, Adgar, he healed him and presented the gospel and he became a Christian. But an apostate nephew of King Adgar took Thaddeus prisoner. He was beaten to death with a big club. This man literally turned the world upside down. They established the church, extended the kingdom of God, and touched the entire world with the gospel. Yet they were not spared suffering. In fact, they died suffering in the most agonizing way. Robert Murray McShane wrote, and I quote, Some believers are very surprised when they are called to suffer. They thought they would do some great thing for God, but all God permits them to do is to suffer. Just suppose you could speak with those who have gone to, to be with the Lord. Everyone has a different story. Yet everyone has a tale of suffering. One was persecuted by family and friends. Another was inflicted with pain and disease, neglected by the world. Another was bereaved of children. Another had all these afflictions. But you will notice that though the water was deep, they all have reached the other side. No one of them blames God for the road he led them. Salvation is their only cry. Are there any of you, dear children, murmuring at your lot? Do not sin against God. This is the way God leads all his redeemed ones. End of quote. Hebrews 5 verse 8 reminds us, Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. So our Lord's experience teaches us that suffering is necessary. He suffered himself. Of course, when the writer of Hebrews said that the Lord suffered, he was referring to Christ's experience in the Garden of Gethsemane. We know this because Hebrews 5 verse 7 indicates this. You see, as the Lord Jesus faced the cross, it was not the physical suffering that burdened him, but the fact that he would be made sin and separated from his Father. Other servants of God have faced death and not expressed such great emotion, but no other servant bore the sins of the world. Hence, we understand why the Lord agonized in the garden. He was made sin, and as such was separated from his Father. So just like with our, with our Lord, the path of the Christian is not, is not always bright with sunshine. He has his seasons of darkness and storm. In other words, the true-born child of God will not escape suffering. To be sure, men have suffered and died because of their own sins, but only the Lord Jesus died for the sins of the world. But this is our encouragement. Christ Jesus experienced the ultimate in suffering, and therefore, 
he is able to sympathize with his people when they are suffering. So, no matter what trials we meet, the Lord Jesus is able to understand our needs and able to help us. We need, we need never doubt his ability to sympathize and to strengthen. Now, aside from giving us a picture of the depth of his trouble, David tells us in the midst of his misery that he was transparent. So this is the second aspect in the psalm. Verses 9 to 10, Lord, all my desire is before you, and my sighing is not hidden from you. My heart throbs, my strength fails me, and the light of my eyes, even that, has gone from me. So David appealed to God in complete transparency. He hid nothing from God or from anyone who would hear this psalm. But the truth is we are not like this. Our instinct is to follow the pattern of Adam and Eve and hide our sin and hide from God. David here is therefore an example of the kind of unconcealed communication that is important for the one who truly desires God. And being transparent with God can only happen if we exercise self-examination. Of course, the need to exercise self-examination is not for God's benefit. God sees everything in us. He does not need us to be transparent in order to see the inner recesses of our hearts. But in our self-examination, we learn to come to God in humility. And then perhaps God may give us relief in our if our suffering is connected to sin. Now, even if the relief is not given, we still need to pursue Christ's likeness. And we will benefit greatly from an honest self-examination of our lives. I suggest, therefore, the following when we are un undergoing some great calamity or sickness. Ask yourself these questions. Have I strayed from the path of obedience? And is this setback God's way of getting me back on the right path and into fellowship with Him? Even as we ponder this question for self-examination, I do not, however, think that we should overthink this and be morbid in digging up a catalog of past failures and sins which we can exaggerate in our confessions. I think that if God is using our ailment or suffering to get our attention, He will make it clear that this is what He is doing. Otherwise, it would be a futile exercise. I believe if God is doing this with you, He will let you know, just as David did. We may also ask ourselves during a time of self-examination, is God using this to make me realize the sins that I regularly harbor? As we examine ourselves, we must watch out for sins that we have repeatedly rationalized, more, most particularly the sins that others have pointed out because that's our tendency. When others reprove us, we have a tendency to rationalize our sins to them. Have we blamed others for our sin? What reasons have we given ourselves for looking the other way? How have we feared man and rationalized sin to please ourselves and others? Instead of being angry with your spouse, parent, brother or sister for pointing out your sins, you must learn to accept godly and truthful reproof. We all need to be reproved at times, and it might be helpful to think of it as a gift from the Lord to make us more like Christ Jesus, even if it is given imperfectly or ungraciously. It would also be helpful to ask, is God using our suffering as a stage upon which His name and wisdom might be glorified? Perhaps our suffering is for us to show to others who the Lord is 
entirely apart from whatever material or physical benefits he may have given us. This is perhaps the hardest purpose to accept. But this is why Job and the Lord's disciples, as we have seen, are outstanding examples of suffering. And we should have an element of this when we suffer, simply because we are told to glorify God in everything we do, suffering included. This theme is also in Psalm 38. Note that even if David confesses that he is being judged for his sin, he is nevertheless glorifying God because he is not faulting God for it, but is instead praising God, the source of mercy and salvation. For David and for us, any trial can be viewed as an opportunity to take not a few moments, but a period of time to enter into extended prayer, self-examination, and reflection, to take inventory of our growth in the Lord. And it is suffering which leads us to, le to lean on the Lord Jesus all the more and to demonstrate His character in our lives. The third and final aspect of this psalm is the glimmer of hope David sees in coming to the Lord in petitionary prayer. Despite his ailment and spiritual depression, David clung to the Lord in hope. Psalm 38 verses 15 to 16 and 21 to 22 says, For I hope in you, O Lord, you will answer, O Lord my God. For I said, May they not rejoice over me, who, when my foot slips, would magnify themselves against me. Verse 21, Do not forsake me, O Lord, O my God. Do not be far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. Though David did not feel it in the midst of his suffering, he said in faith, I hope in you, O Lord. You will answer O oh Lord, my God. David looked for and trusted in God's intervention. But how could he do this when he knew that he was guilty of sin? Well, by experience, he was well acquainted with the character of God. Thus, he wrote in verse 4 of Psalm chapter 9, For you have maintained my just cause. You have sat on the throne judging righteously you see he knew that god was righteous and would act according to his righteous character hope in god's holy character and his intervention and belief in the exercise or power of prayer are blessed supports to the soul in times of adversity and when sickness slander and sin all assail a believer. He needs the special help of his heavenly Father. Thus David said, Do not forsake me, O Lord. Do not be far from me. Make haste to help me. The truth is, God does not really forsake his children. Psalm 37 verse 28 reminds us, For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his godly ones. They are preserved forever. Of course, there are times when God withdraws for His purposes the sense of His presence and favor so that believers feel as if they were forsaken, but this is only temporary. And He never forsakes His godly ones. You know, Martin Luther's last written words were, We are all beggars. Two days later, he died. He was right, of course, in that final written testimony. If we think of ourselves as achievers, creators, reformers, innovators, movers, shakers, educators, or benefactors of society in any way at all, we are merely fooling ourselves. We have nothing and have never had anything that we have not received from God's hand. 
nor have we done anything good apart from God who did it through us. This is true as Luther con constantly insisted with regard to the pardon of our sins and the justification of our souls. And it is equally, equally true of life, health, food, clothing, a job, a home, a family, a car, a bank balance, and every other good thing that comes our way. So before God's throne, we are all beggars. And begging gifts from God is what petitionary prayer is about. We ask God as beggars for what we need because He invites us to do so. Christians know this clearly. For God in the scriptures is explicit about it. 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 to 15. This is the confidence which we have before Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us in whatever we ask. We know that we have requests which we have asked from Him. The very nature of prayer, prayers of petition emphasizes our true relationship with God. He is the provider, we receivers. He is the master of the universe, we his small creatures. God is the maker of all things, and we are completely dependent on what He gives us. God, in His kindness and grace, is most forthcoming in inviting us, His people, to ask. This was what King David understood. This was what King David did in the midst of suffering. For I hope in you, O Lord, make haste to help me. Let me close with this story. In 1820, in Dublin, Ireland, a boy named Joseph was born to a prosperous family. But he learned suffering at an early age. Before he was 25, he was estranged from his family because of his Protestant faith in Christ. Eventually, Joseph met a lovely young woman and became engaged. But the night before he was married, his beloved fiancé drowned. He immigrated to Port Hope, Canada to start his life over again as a school teacher. Years later, he met another young woman and they were engaged to be married, but she died of pneumonia just before the wedding. Joseph's charity, his massive impact on the community, and his giving, loving Christ-like character earned him the nickname the Good Samaritan. When he learned that his mother back in Ireland was seriously ill, Joseph was not able to return to her, but he instead wrote a poem to remind her of the love of her Savior. Joseph Scriven's poem was originally called Pray Without Ceasing, but it was eventually changed. And now we know this song as What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Like I said at the start, we learn our sweetest songs when the blackness of trial and suffering close around us. I invite you to sing this song as we end. Spain.
invite you now to close with a word of prayer. Almighty God and Father, we are truly grateful for your word which teaches us that your mercies are new every morning. Perhaps some of us, dear God, have offended you and your holiness these past days. Perhaps we have knowingly disobeyed you. Perhaps we have sinned against your word. But we come to you, dear Lord, like King David, asking that you rebuke us not in your wrath or anger. Instead, extend to us your great mercy. We wait upon you, O Lord, and trust in your, in your abundant grace and love. We trust also that you will continue to keep us safe from this virus, and we look forward to the day when Having preserved your church, we will come together in wonderful fellowship as one body. We give you praise and thanks for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name we pray. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You're my firm foundation I know I can stand secure Jesus, you're my firm foundation I put my hope in your holy word I put my hope in your holy word Jesus, you're my firm foundation I know I can stand secure Jesus 
Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your holy word. I have a living hope. I have a living hope. I have a future. I have a future. God has a plan for me. Of this I'm sure. Of this I'm sure. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I know I can stand secure. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your holy word. Your word is faithful. Your word is faithful. Mighty in power. Mighty in power. God will deliver me. Of this I'm sure. Of this I'm sure. You're my firm foundation. I know I can stand secure. Jesus, you're my firm foundation.